I, I do have to admit, I, I flew in late last night, and so I think now is about the time I normally wake up in California time. And one of the advantages of, of working at Google and having this, this great food is also having an uh, amazing gym. So I normally start my morning with a quick workout, and I didn't get a chance to do that today. So do you mind doing a quick exercise with me, everybody? Is that okay? Everybody, hold out your hands. Hold, hold out your hands. Wiggle your fingers. Wiggle, 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 wiggle. I told you they would do this. Turn your hands inside out, inside out, and right hand over the left, cross them, and interlock your fingers. Make sure your fingers are tight, and then get your thumbs to point down. Make sure, make sure your thumbs are pointing down. Yep, th thumbs pointing down. And then straight to the left, and straight up. I think I lost some people. Hopefully that's the only time I will lose you during this prezzo um, as we talk about uh, security in the cloud. So I, I also spoke at uh, RSA a couple months ago, and they called 2014 the year of the, not just the breach, but the year of the mega breach, right? And then some people started calling it in their keynotes the mega, mega breach. Well, it definitely we had a lot of big breaches in 2014, but it shouldn't be surprising because there's lots of different motivators for that. First one is more and more data is just online. Even if we do a transaction that's not online, that data ends up oftentimes getting online. Security, and I don't have to tell this to you guys, um, is complicated. Right? And as Security professionals, we have to be right all the time. We don't get to make a mistake. And the attackers, the adversaries, hackers, state-sponsored, they all have to be right once, and they get to compromise all the information. And then, of course, work has changed. 50% of users say that they have better technology at home than they do today at work. Th that, that, that's amazing. I'm, I'm a little older than I look, so I've said, um, but I remember when I started work, I used to have better technology at work, and when I had to do complicated processing, I would bring that to my sh machines to do at work. Well, now that's not the case. Now users, especially those that have growing into the workforce now, grew up with things like Google, like instant messaging, Gmail, and you take those technologies away, you take away instant messaging from the people entering the workforce, it's like tying an Italian person's hands. They just don't know how to talk anymore. That gets a laugh in the US. Um, so it's not, I don't believe most people are evil, but we're all busy, right? And we're all trying to get our job done. And if it's easier for me to bring in a tool from home with consumerization of IT because I can find the menu of a restaurant 3,000 miles, 3, miles away, but I'm still struggling to find basic information about what happened last quarter in my organizations, users are going to do that. Right? And how do we re react as a profession to normally to these, these user trends? We do what most security professionals do. We write more policies, we lock down services, and I contend that's a matter of time before that's actually not going to work, right? We're not gonna be able to turn off Facebook, turn off Google Drive, turn off Dropbox within our organizations unless we give users a better thing to do. And I think that's what actually brings Motivator to the cloud, right? In my mind, I'm gonna make a a uh, projection here, hopefully that uh, by the end of the talk, a lot of you will agree with me, that cloud can be as secure, if not more secure, than what most organizations are doing today. And hopefully you'll see why. But cloud is also this perfect intersection of where what we as security professionals want from a control uh, and, and visibility perspective as well as what users want from the ability to innovate and be able to move and use. How do I use Snapchat at work? How do I use Facebook at work? What are the work values of that? I think the cloud is actually where this comes together. Now I've said the word cloud probably about eight times already. Um, and cloud means lots of different things for lots of different people. 
I'm going to talk today mainly about software as a service, right? But I really borrowed this slide from the Cloud Security Alliance because I think this is one of their best slides uh, that they came up with. But it shows the differences in the different types of cloud and what it means from a security perspective, from an infrastructure perspective to a SaaS perspective, right? So from an infrastructure perspective, you're basically just renting the boxes. You're renting the pipes. But you're still responsible for a lot of that security. You're still responsible for the care and feeding of those servers. You're still responsible for patching. You're still responsible for ensuring they're backed up, etc. As a software as a service, you can take a look at it both ways from different perceptions. One, you go, oh, well, I don't have that control anymore. Or two, it's great that I don't have that control. I need to make sure that my supplier, my vendor, is doing it the way I feel comfortable with. And that's what they call RFPing security. Uh, so, but still, regardless of which environment you're in, when you move into the cloud, you're giving the cloud provider potentially one of your most valuable assets, which is your data. Right? So whether you're doing the security or they're doing the security, you need to understand how it's being managed. And that really rises up to what does it mean to move to the cloud? A lot of these things that we're talking now about the cloud, and when I told my grandma, I've been at Google about eight years, when I told my grandma I'm going to do cloud security, she's like, you're going to do security for airplanes? So that also gets a laugh in the U.S. Must be my lack of British humor. Um, but but some, a lot of these things really have, are items that we looked at when we started doing a lot of outsourcing in the early 2000s, right? So these issues... Are, are, are recycling these issues, but on a mega scale. So the first issue to understand is who owns the data? When you put the data into your cloud provider, do you still own it? Do they have rights to it? What are their rights? What can they use that data for? Right? Can they use that data just to provide me services? Can they use that data to improve services? Can they use that data for their commercial benefit? And different cloud providers will have different models. Oftentimes, we're compared, um, the Google business aspect is compared very similar to the Google consumer aspect. But yet, they have very, very different rights about what they do for data. One is monetized by ads, and the other businesses pay to use. So with that comes pros and cons. Understanding that security breaches will happen. That's, that's the one thing we can be sure about, that a security breach will, be, will happen. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But how will you know? Will your cloud provider tell you? And within what time frame? How will they ensure that you have the right information to understand what of your data was impacted? A breach may be an email compromised about my favorite soccer team, or it could also be my confidential information about my next year's plans. I need to make the decision, not the cloud provider. But if they don't tell me, I can't make that decision. What about leaving? Right. A lot of companies that I speak to today are locked in and are not being able to benefit from the cloud because they're locked in, their data is not portable. How do I ensure, and this is something that tends to get forgotten because it's not traditional security, it's not traditional business, that I have the ability to take my data with me when I leave, right? And, and, and what is that going to cost me? Is that going to cost me? And can I take it into a format and move it to another cloud provider? May I be able to move it into on-premise? And then where's the data stored? Just by a show of hands, who thinks data location gives me better security? If the data is stored in specific places, I get better security. Raise your hands high so we can just get about a percentage. Say about 10% about of the room. Okay, okay. Um, well, I, I, I make a notion here that data security, data location does not improve security. I, actually, the reverse. So my first argument for this is adversaries don't abide by geographical borders. 
I haven't seen a hacker yet saying, oh, that data is in London. I better not attack it. I would really rather attack it if it was in Belgium. Right? There is definitely, with data location, some aspects of regulation, right? But let, let's separate that from security. I mean, there's things in Europe, obviously, like safe harbor, model contract clauses. I understand that, appreciate that we support those. And there's also different regulations on specific types of data. There's some types of data that may not be allowed to leave the country, right? Like Swiss banking, law, Swiss banking laws require that Swiss banking data stays in Switzerland. Completely appreciate that. But just because the data is located in a specific region or specific country doesn't make it more secure. We have dozens of different data centers, and I can tell you that every data center has the same minimum security requirement regardless of whether it's stored in the United States, whether it's stored in Brazil, whether it's stored in Europe. And they get audited and they have the same practices. So, so far, everything is sound, starting to sound rosy. They're saying, why then, you're probably saying, why then is this cloud still a problem? Why are we even still discussing cloud computing? Well, I think there are some interesting challenges, but the number one biggest unsolved problem that we learned from 2014 around cloud computing is authentication. Right? In, in, in the regular conversation, I get to look at you and determine, are you really Harry? Are you really John? But in reality, most online services still just rely on username, password. If I get to guess your password, snoop your password, I get to impersonate you. And I get the same access and privileges that you had. If you look really at all the breaches from 2014 when we analyzed them, about 88% of them all related. While they were sophisticated and, and sophisticated social engineering aspects, it basically came down to getting a user's password. And we're committed at Google to solve that, not just for, for our users, but for the industry as a whole. And about three weeks ago, we released this thing. Um, who, who, who heard about Password Alert? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, very few. We didn't do a lot of, enough press on it, about 2%. That's my rough estimate. What we found, obviously, is, and this is a free tool. I encourage you to go download this, use this. Uh, I'm not in sales, I'm responsible for security, so everything you hear me say today, if I say things that I like at Google, they're because usually, one, I like them, or two, I encourage you to use and they're free. Um, so it's a free tool, it's, in, it's a Chrome extension um, that we discovered that users do reuse those, those passwords, right? That your corporate password gets reused for your Netflix, gets reused for your Twitter, gets reused for your Yahoo account, etc. And some of those may not have the same level of security because they're protecting different type of information, right? So if Net your Netflix account gets hacked, that's maybe less risky to you, might have more consequences to Netflix than your corporate information, right? So this tool set up on your Chrome extension, either by admins or by users, lets you notify when you actually typed in your password in that same password into anything but a Google login page. So it first looks to make sure that is a legitimate Google login page and then lets you know. I'll, I'll tell you, this happens to more users than you expect. Right? And the other reason this happens a lot is because of phishing. We can't expect our users to understand what is a legitimate site or not. Can you tell if account at google.com or accounts at google.com, which one is the correct login? Especially if they both look the same, right? So we need to make it easier for users to do the right thing and alert them when they don't. The other thing that we released a couple years ago, um, just by show of hands, who, who's a Gmail user? Oh wow, that, now a lot of hands went up. Who, who's not a Gmail user? Leave. 
Um, because passwords uh, st still so much rely about it, is uh, we were the first ones to come up with an OTP. And as really as security professionals, especially the Gmail users, I really highly recommend this is free. If you take one thing away from this talk, if you take two things away, this is going to be one of them. Go enable this on your account. So now I don't just need um, your password. I need an OTP. That's an app that's sent on your phone or it sends you an SMS. So a hacker uh, or attacker can't just crack your password but needs this password that changes every 60 seconds. With the goal of still making passwords even more invisible to users, uh, we released this two weeks ago uh, for businesses, about six months ago for consumers, a physical key. Rather than sending a password, it does an electronic uh, cryptographic signature that sends a hash back to Google to authenticate. So again, trying to make passwords go away. This is a big problem. You can see some of the stuff we've done with smart lock on Android phones, but as an industry, we need to solve it. So back to, I want to look at the cloud, whether it's Google or somebody else. The real question you need to ask, and, and this is a very tough question to ask, is my cloud provider more secure than I am? Nobody wants to admit that they have an ugly baby, but some babies are ugly. My girlfriend gets really peeved when I say that, but that's my opinion. Um, but they may have not been, it may have been a right decision back in the day, right? So a lot of the technologies that organizations use, so I've been at Google eight years before that, I was the chief information security officer of a major financial services company, and I made all kinds of decisions that were right at the time for those technologies, right? 20 years ago, buying beta cams would have made a lot of sense. Nobody's going out and buying beta cams today. And those technologies got ingrained into organizations, but they're not built to deal with today's threats. They're not built with adversaries that can try one million passwords in under a minute to try to crack an account. So cloud providers have some of this benefit of architecting these technologies for this current threat environment. But how do you understand um, whether they are secure or whether they're not? That's really the question. And there's a couple different ways. I'll talk to the first specifically about Google. Um, I'm selling these t-shirts after the show. Just kidding. We came out with something that was really cool and different. Um, a couple years ago where we actually want to thank people from breaking into our systems. Right. So it used to be that if you told an organization that you broke into their environment, they would typically respond with a legal cease and desist letter. Right? They'd stop you, put a gag order on you, you can't tell anybody. We've taken the different approach where we actually thank people and last year, we gave about one and a half million dollars away as part of this program, with the largest reward being about $150,000. Um, and we issue press releases. This is something where a lot of these lessons, I'm hoping you guys can take back to your organizations. Yes, you may not have one and a half million dollars to give away as a bounty program, but maybe the way you work with security researchers or people that notify you about items, treat them as security researchers, at, at least until they show otherwise. We also discovered that there's a lot of vulnerabilities out there that we don't control. A lot of technologies that we are built upon that we don't have complete control over, right? Things like HTTPS, OpenSSL, et cetera. So we built a team of people um, called Project Zero that actually goes out and looks for vulnerabilities in different s softwares that is widely used on the internet and notify those organizations when we find a vulnerability. So responsible disclosure, responsible response. And we try to give them 30 days, which has kind of been the magic number uh, to let them to uh, respond to that before we make, uh, we make it public. So now I, wa I want to be 
pretty transparent and tell you about some of the things we do at Google to secure customer data. I'm not saying this is the right thing, but again, I'm hoping these are some lessons that you take from us and it seems to work very well uh, for us for the scale that we operate. So first, Google is actually really unique, unlike most other organizations where we control the entire stack. Um, we design our own chips, we design our own motherboards, uh, we obviously use hard drives. We actually have better numbers on hard drive failures than a lot of the hard drive manufacturers just because of the, the number we use. This allows you to build really cool security into every layer. So for example, all of our systems look identical. And part of the problem I used to have as a CISO is I had this wonderful heterogeneous environment that was great. It let me pick a lot of different vendors and I could switch if, if this vendor was going to be better one year versus that vendor. But it becomes a challenge to manage and it comes a challenge to patch. And you think that you're introducing complexity is, is great for the attacker, but that complexity also introduces for you from understanding what issues you have. So we've taken the opposite approach and made sure everything is actually identical from server number one in the United States to server number one million that may be sitting in Belgium or some other country. We've also learned that security, that IT systems and security systems fail. If there's something else you can be sure about is that systems are going to fail. And how can you build an environment that has enough redundancy and is self-healing to account for that failure, right, is critical. And one of the big things for that was the way data is stored. So we've taken a very different approach on storage and uh, I'll explain this using Gmail just so you kind of get an understanding. Um, if in a traditional email environment, all of my mail would be sitting on one server, right? And then I might replicate that server for redundancy and uh, disaster recovery perspective. Um, but all of my other staff would be sitting on that same mail servers, all the vice presidents, etc. So it's actually a really easy target for the adversaries. All they need to do is compromise one single server and they've owned you. They have not just one person's email, they have everybody's. And on top of that, we've actually put a, a nice map in the traditional environment for them. We've called, probably my mail would probably be called something like efeigenbaum.db and it go, oh yeah, he's the security professional, let's go after that one. He probably has some juicy stuff. That's the environment that most of us live in today. Right? So we've learned from that and taken a different approach. We've taken everybody's email and we've chunked it up into lots of small pieces. And we spread those pieces across the entire environment. So now I don't have a server that's dedicated to me, but I have lots of servers that each have a little chunk. And we've made those chunks also not plain text. We either encrypted them or obfuscated, depending them on the technology. So now they're not humanly readable. And we've given each one of those chunks a completely random file name so I can't associate them back with a specific user. Right? Now each one of these chunks, we've made at least six copies. So if you're one of those people that raised your hand for Gmail, something doesn't come back as being successful until it happens six times. Three times within a single data center and three times within a secondary data center. So I fully expect a drive to fail. I fully expect a rack of drives to fail and even an entire data center to go down with hopefully without users ever knowing, right? So this is a very dynamic switch uh, between data center. Now, the other reason I think cloud providers have a competitive advantage against most individual companies trying to do their own IT is just the scale. Now, I don't want you to think that I'm saying, oh, give it all to a cloud provider. That's not what I'm saying at all. 
but I think there's lots of core competencies and lots of data that you can put in a cloud provider and use your resources that you have left to secure the technologies that you are remaining, right? So you may have some comp competitive technologies that make sense to keep in-house, but things like email, data storage, basic processing may make sense to put in a cloud because if you look, we have, this, this is actually an old number now, probably it's close to 450 with our current recruiting. 450 security professionals. I don't know too many organizations outside of intelligence agencies that have that many people in security. That may be larger than many of your own IT organizations, right? With people working around the clock. That trying, we also learned that trying to wake somebody up, right, in the middle of the night with a pager, and hoping they have enough coffee or Red Bull to make right decisions doesn't always work, right? So following the sun, having core operations in different locations with core competency to make sure they can deal with, uh, with issues. So what are the main threats that uh, pe people ask me, Aaron, you're responsible for all this data, you you're have all these customers that rely on you, H how do you sleep uh, at night? Um, and the reality is I sleep like a baby. I wake, up, I wake up every hour and cry. No. That even gets a better laugh in the U.S. Man, this is a rough crowd. <laughs> Try the liver. Uh, no. Well, but there's, there's, there's three buckets of areas that, that, I, that I'm concerned about when I, when I think about security at Google. Um, first is the lost hardware, right? Um, obviously, managing millions and millions of drives, how do you make sure a drive doesn't get out of your data center, right? Even more so, and I spoke to a CISO, I won't say of who, but they're a major 100 organization two weeks ago, and I made this next statement, a light turned on. Uh, he's a new CISO for that organization, maybe that's why, but when your hard drive fails and you're calling the vendor to replace that hard drive, do you know what happened with that failed hard drive? Do you understand what they have to do to wipe it, to shred it, to destroy it, to make sure that any remnants of data that may have been on there before it failed uh, was removed? So at Google, we actually have a process. We, we track every drive, uh, and each drive has a, has a barcode. And I can tell you at any given point in time where that drive is, who put it there, what data was on there. And if that drive, uh, wow, okay. Uh, if that drive was, I just got the five minutes. Um, if that drive was removed, uh, I know when it got uh, taken out from that and uh, put back into inventory. And if it wasn't scanned back within the allotted amount of time, it starts sending an escalation all the way up to a VP, which will lock that data center. Right. And when, t when a drive can't be deleted or erased, each data center has this physical shredder that physically goes in, a drive comes out little metal confetti to make sure that nobody can, uh, can read that. Uh, and having two people to confirm this is also important. Um, physical intruder, I, I, I think this is less of a concern today uh, other than having uh, for, for specific states, uh, state-sponsored attacks, right, and making sure you understand where your data centers are built. So I think from this aspect, Data location is important, making sure your data centers are in locations that have uh, good laws, good policies, uh, abide by human rights, et cetera, uh, to make sure that uh, they're not uh, getting into uh, data centers. And then obviously, network intrusion. Now, it's wonderful for me to come up here and, uh, and say all these wonderful things about Google or any cloud provider, but I don't expect you to take my word for it for Google, and I don't expect you to take the other cloud provider's word for it for them. Um, but do look at these third-party audits. These are actually a wonderful resource. Don't just accept the fact that the cloud provider got a check mark for one of these. Demand to see one of these reports. I can tell you we hand out thousands of these reports a year. Some of these reports are several hundred pages thick. So you can understand the detail of how your cloud provider is, uh, is doing something. My second, my, my second point, if you take two things away, just by a show of hands, 
Who in the last year has practiced an intrusion drill as if they've gotten hacked res- re- practicing that response? Re- raise your a- a- and responding to a real incident doesn't count. Very few, very few, about 2%. If you take two things away, we got really good since the year 2000 at, at practicing disaster recovery. We still haven't gotten very good at this. And I can tell you that practicing a drill uh, when it's not really an intrusion, understanding who needs to be involved, what engineers have to be there, what legal folks have to be there, what customer relationships people, PR, marketing, et cetera. These are all interested parties before you go notify about a security breach to your customers. Really, it's wonderful to have a plan, but it's something that you should practice on a yearly basis. Um, and this is something we actually do uh, very regularly. Uh, on that note, I think I have a couple minutes for, uh, for questions, and I know I uh, ran through some of that, so I'm glad to take any questions about uh, Google or Google security. Uh, I think there's a mic uh, going around. You all look uh, stoned. I mean stunned. <laughs> uh, we have one here. I'll just see that guy first. Thank you. Hi. Um, you talked about authentication being a major problem in the cloud. So how about the password recovery process? How do you allow that without sacrificing I mean, you got, a, you got two factor, but you need to allow recovery, so how yeah. do you balance that? Yeah. No, I, I, think, I think that's a, that's a next question. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I, it's, it's, it's definitely a balance, right? Uh, security and usability is always uh, a balance, and you find, need to find a balance. Um, I'll tell you what we've done internally, right? So if you have, obviously, if I'm here in London and uh, lost my second factor, uh, we have a way to give me a short one-time password that will have a life to live uh, until I can go get back my, my second factor. Uh, there, there's lots of different other ways of turning on two factor, turning off two factor for a period amount of time, uh, giving emergency codes or, uh, or FedExing a uh, second factor back out. Last question, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll be available afterwards. Uh, you said uh, data center location. It's important to have good human rights laws, good privacy laws in place. Uh, given the Snowden leaks, how do the UK and the US compare for that? How, how does the, the UK and the US compare to Snowden? So, so I, uh, boy, I'm going to try to be, not be political. Uh, as I just literally turned on the BBC this morning and heard some new newness about UK uh, new laws. Um, so I, I, I think... Obviously, states need to do what they need to do as, uh, as part of uh, security uh, and ensuring security for their professionals. And uh, organizations need to make sure that they put in um, good security practices and technologies to prevent unwanted eavesdroppers uh, and then allow uh, states to have legal process uh, to request that data. Guys, thank you very much. I'll be around to answer any questions you may have. There's a panel this afternoon. Answer more there. Thank you.